Welcome to the Awakened Sober Podcast. It's a podcast about life and recovery through Christ. How's everybody doing today? I'm glad everybody got to show up. It's been wow. a while since we've all been here together. It has been. It's been. And yeah. we're here together today, and I'm really happy to see that. The last time it was a little busy. It was. It's a little busy. But we're here today. Yes. Man, and today's going to be a fun day. Fun today's going to be a great day. I'm very honored for today's uh, podcast. Why is that? We have a special guest today, and it is... Uh, his name is Will. His name is Will, and Will is is one of our, our sponsors. Yeah. What's our sponsor? Tactile Turn, buddy. <laughs> Tactile it's Turn, man. We, we got use. stuff all over the place. Yeah, we do. <laughs> got copper. This one. Oh, he's going to he's gonna go through the whole Zerk. thing, Will. Yeah. He's going to break out copper, Zerk. Zerk. I got the Grinch. The Grinch. Yeah. Man, <laughs> this guy. Yeah. The reverse 8-bit. Yes. yes. The reverse 8-bit. Well, why he's going through them all. Oh, nice. Mike, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, man. It's good to see you guys. It really is. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks, and I missed you. Mm-hmm. I, missed you I missed you guys so much. I wish we could say the same. I know, me too. But uh, no, life is good, man. <laughs> um, works good. Recovery is going well. Um, last Sunday, we celebrated two years sober. Yeah. Congratulations. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Golf clap. Yes. Um, and um, starting another new step with my sponsor on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to that. I got uh, three days off of work and I'm going to take advantage. I bet you are. Oh, I'm going to take advantage of it. It's going to be nice. But yeah, man, everything's good. D, how are you? I'm all right, man. Doing all right. Actually, things have gotten better. There's light at the end of this dark tunnel I've been on for the last couple of weeks. So I'm actually excited. Uh, today went really, really well. It was really surprising how well today went for me. <laughs> and that, and, and, and you laugh, but it'd be, I was taking care of things that were messed up from the person that was in the position before me at, at another, at, you know, at our other facility. So it was like, oh my gosh, this is stuff back in December. What am I going to do with it? But I made it happen, and you know it went very smoothly. It's handled, and when the person comes in and takes this position from me, they're gonna. It's gonna be a good. They're gonna be. It's not gonna be as um, hectic as it was when I did. Good. So I'm, I nice. feel good about that. Yeah. So they'll be able to do their job when they come in. Yes, they can walk right in and just start where I where I dropped pass the baton off. And they can take off running. That See easy. ya. They don't have to pick it up and you know clean up the mess and you know run with it. They just take off running. Just hope they don't fall flat on their face. Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Uh, it has been a very uh, long 72 hours at work uh, for me. Just busy. Um, had some guys at the sober living house. One of the guys, um, well, he relapsed. So dealing with that till the late hours of the uh, morning. But uh, other than that, uh, everything else is going pretty good. Good deal. Yeah, I guess my turn. How are yeah, you? It is well. You. <laughs> it is well with my soul. Last night we kicked off. Um, well, actually, I can't say we kicked it off. We did a soft launch for our celebrate recovery, and it was fun. It was uh, it was exciting just because we know we're right there. We're gonna do one more soft launch next week, and then March fifth we're gonna fully kick it off. And so- gentlemen, invite six o'clock, six fifteen for dinner. Come join us next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Yeah, it's usually six cool. o'clock for dinner, but we gotta we gotta tear down a stage and set up a stage and <laughs> we tear do. down some kids stuff and get it off to the side. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's but, just temporary because everything's being done, things are being put into motion, and that we won't have to be doing that after a period of time. We're just gonna be really happy. Yeah, the toilets are installed in the new side. Just nice. no partitions yet. I'll oh. be there. Yeah, it's gonna. It's a blast, man. We'll it's need good a partition. to see. Huh? I we'll need a partition. Um, no, you don't. But. Yeah. Better to have one. We don't. We don't want to see everybody going to the bathroom. <laughs> nah, there's not even bathroom. <laughs> there's not even doors on the bathrooms yet. This is a church, dang it! Oh, and there's a window in the men's room, my right old, at the uh, toilet, uh, dude. Uh, you don't want to see that. <laughs> uh, where I went to college in Nebraska, it was like an old army barracks. So there was, it was just the toilets lined up. That was it. Just wide open. It's wide open. There that's that's, that's awesome. He went to school in Nebraska. You know, I went on I went on a vac- <laughs> I went to the vacation where I stayed at on vacation. The bathrooms were like that. There was no partitions in between the toilet stools, man. Yeah, so, you know, yeah that's not a vacation. There was nothing that's in prison. prison. <laughs> <laughs> there was no walk between the showers either. Well, yeah, five see, year prison vacation. was not a vacation, brother. 
Uh, well, you know, I didn't. Have it was to a really sabbatical. A sabbatical. There you go. <laughs> I didn't have to pay for anything. Right? No. Oh, well. I don't know. It's the state of Florida, man. They charge me for being there. <laughs> anyway. Hey, Will, how are you doing? Good to have you here. Doing well. Doing well. Uh, excited to be a uh, part of this. And it uh, looks like you got uh, a good group of guys around you. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. We will give each other a hard time. One of them walked in too late to have an excellent dinner. My my wife has been cooking on Wednesday nights for us for the uh, mm-hmm. for the podcast, and she made fajitas tonight. So they were Thanks. they were good and yummy. Yeah, I guess Jeremy may be stopping by the. I will be the kitchen on the way out. Yeah, yeah, those yeah, over there, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully we'll be other. Like but no. <laughs> hopefully we could come down by you Just and um, go for a tour. What do you say? Something about a mic. What happened, I was Will? just going to say, you can cut the mic off and go grab some fajitas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like them already. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, food is a, a, a necessary, necessary part of recovery, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is. Yes. Yes. We are some guys that can eat. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, none of us are small in this room. <laughs> no. You know, that would be cool to do a remote from down there. That would be really neat. That would be. I would love to take you guys down there. One, we could eat Trinkies um, right yeah. by the shop. And then go for a tour in the shop. Will, how's yeah. that sound? We let Will maybe let us do a show in the shop. Come on down. Come on down. <laughs> he always <laughs> says the same our, thing. Just come on down. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, he'll never turn. We, uh, we can probably figure out some some way to do some sound deadening stuff because, uh, well, and we don't run as many hours these days, so we can we can have the machines off. And I won't fine. mind the sound. Come on down. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be that'd be awesome. Thank so, you. Give us a little bit about yourself, some background. Where were you born, yep. raised, any religious upbringing? Uh, so born in Dallas, uh, currently live in Richardson, just uh, outside of Dallas. Uh, so haven't moved very far. Um, I guess um, have pretty much stayed in Dallas my entire life or somewhere around Dallas. Um, didn't have a religious, uh, I guess, uh, childhood. My next door neighbors were... Uh, Southern Baptist and went to church with them a few times. I uh, was in Boy Scouts and um, an Eagle Scout. And really, that was the most church I ever really did. Um, kind of, you know, the, the we were the uh, the ushers every fifth Sunday that there was. Uh, so, you know, a couple times a year. So really, you know, didn't do a whole lot of spiritual anything. Didn't do a whole lot of religious anything as a kid. Uh, my parents uh, were somewhat raised in uh christian churches but they i think somewhere in like their teens were kind of given the option to go or not um and they decided to kind of stop i guess and so they were never you know i don't remember them ever talking about faith of any sort which is kind of a a shame you know I, i sobered up um i guess Effectively, a couple weeks after uh, my dad passed away, or a week after my, my dad passed away, uh, and so you know, there there was never any chance to talk to him about it. And really, my mom just you know, she she liked the church uh, for some reasons, but she she really never made it a priority in adulthood. And there were some times that she'd mentioned how she sort of regretted that, but um, you know, religion was just never a huge piece of uh, you know my upbringing for quite a few of us yeah yeah i mean for, i mean for me it was i went to catholic school k through 12 <laughs> and i got the same uh kind of thing you know i turned thir- 12 or 13 and i got that choice and i stopped going because what 13 year old wants to go to church i guess that's why we don't give our kids a choice <laughs> yeah mine won't have one i know yeah. that <laughs> yeah there's there's nothing wrong with that so tell us about your childhood uh, generally pretty good. Uh, so my parents, uh, like we were talking about sort of before the podcast started, um, my parents made scale models and so they had a small business. And so I kind of grew up around their small business and in their, uh, their shop. Uh, so they mostly did like plastic and, and wood based stuff. My dad, uh, actually my mom started the business, uh, which is kind of a, a strange thing, I guess, for a woman. And <laughs> this was the early seventies. Um, she went to to school and you know got out of school and married a guy and um started this little business and my dad came along a few years later uh and helped out but it was pretty much just them and their their small business and 
So when I was a kid, it was pretty much them. And occasionally they'd have one or two people, but for the most part, uh, they just needed, you know, help here and there. And so when I was really little, I got to help out with making trees and other random little things for their scale models. So they did, you know, developments uh, in and around Dallas and um, some buildings are in and around Dallas. So they were always just needing some, you know, sometimes very low skilled uh, labor. Um, and so I, I got to help out and I just, you know, kind of grew up in, in their shop. Uh, and as I grew a little older, got to help out with, you know, moving things around and got to do slightly more skilled stuff. Um, but generally it was a, 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 you know, pretty, pretty boring <laughs> middle class, uh, you know, lifestyle. Uh, my parents worked pretty hard. My dad worked really hard. Um, and they were, you know, generally good parents. They weren't heavy drinkers or anything. They never used any drugs that I know of. Um, I think they would have, you know, a beer at night, pretty much every night. And that was it. And so when I started drinking sometime, I guess probably 13 or 14, uh, you know, and it wasn't particularly common at that age, but, uh, I pretty much always just wanted to go overboard and there was always a question of like, why do I want to do this this way when my parents never modeled any sort of, you know, overboard thing. But uh, as I grew older, I, I learned that my mom's side of the family has a fair amount of alcoholism in it. And um, so it started to make a little more sense when, you know, the genetic component is uh, strong on that side of the family. Um, and yeah, but generally, you know, good, good, uh, good upbringing, um, you know, did decently in school, even through high school, um, sort of went off the rails towards the end of high school. Well, really beginning of college. So, you know, nothing particularly interesting with uh, childhood. Um, just kind of. He lived a nice, boring life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Quote unquote great. normal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you know, that's the weird thing, right? Like, my sister and I can talk about it. And uh, my sister, when she tells the stories of our childhood, it's, you know, our mom was a, was a, you know, completely self-absorbed person. And <laughs> like, I always thought my mom was a nice lady. And, you know, it's, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that, but um, <laughs> no, you know, not my in sister, our lives. <laughs> what's that? I said, no, nah, not in our lives. <laughs> so how many of, was it just you and your sister then? Yeah. Just me and my sister. Yeah. She's a year and 13 days older than me. So we're virtually Irish twins. <laughs> wow. Seen a lot of that lately. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of uh, talked a little bit about it, but what was your first drink experience like? You said about 13, 14, but what was it like the first time yeah. you remember? Um, so it was a buddy from Boy Scouts. Um, we, he, I guess there were a few of us over at his house. Uh, and I guess he had access to the liquor cabinet and, you know, mixed up. I don't even remember what it was. Um, but I was kind of given a, a big glass of something and knew that it, there was alcohol in it and, uh, drank it down faster than I should have and definitely felt the effects and, Ooh, I like this. Um, you know, there, there wasn't a whole lot of, um, I, I've, I've heard, you know, people talk about the, how it really made them, you know, it, there was just an instant, now I find, you know, can finally feel comfortable here. Uh, and I, I, there was probably some of that. I don't think I ever really felt like I was severely disconnected with, uh, you know, the world when I was a kid, but there's something about alcohol that was just alluring. And, um, you know, that, that first drunk was, um, was a fun one and, uh, hung out with him some more throughout the years, not like every weekend or anything, but, um, definitely, first going completely overboard was with him. Uh, you know, I think probably a couple years later, uh, maybe a year later, probably 15 ish. Um, we, he had a fake ID and, uh, we got, you know, 12 packs of Bud Light, I think it was. And, uh, for some reason I, I decided, you know, this is probably less than, I don't know, fourth or fifth time of uh, drinking, I, I decided to challenge, you know, him and a couple other guys to who's going to finish the 12 pack first, <laughs> um, which, you know, I don't remember that being modeled anywhere or, you know, where I got the idea that drinking these as quickly as possible was going to be a good idea. And of course <laughs> I ended up throwing up all over the place and, you know, wake up the next morning, where, where am I, what happened and get told these horrible stories of, you know, you went completely nuts. Um, but, you know, from very early days, I, I went, 
too hard too quickly. And uh, I think that was one of the the things that was interesting, you know, as I got to to know people that also had, you know, alcohol problems. Starting to hear, you know, there are plenty of people that they drink for a good long time and uh, have, you know, they, they, they have fun most of that time. Um, and then there's some of us that just go balls to the wall from the very beginning. And, you know, there, there wasn't a whole lot of moderating any of my drinking ever. Um, as soon as I had enough supply to, to get drunk, it was pretty much going, going full force for it. What if that's a, like a younger kid thing? <laughs> I was just like, if you yeah. ain't first, you're last. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can even be fifth. <laughs> Competitive. Yeah. I just don't know if that's it, the youngster in us that, that makes you drink like that. Or if it's just some of us, that's what we do. And I think, you know, <laughs> it's funny. It's like, there's a little competitor just inside oh, everybody, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what it is, but. I mean, well, you're not alone. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so you said, you, you know, and, and you said it was pretty balls of the wall from, from just a couple of years after you started. When do you think you realized that you, um, that you had an issue that you had a problem with, with alcohol or substance? You know, I, I think, uh, I, I pretty much tried to stay away from drugs, um, until I graduated high school. And for some reason, somewhere around after graduating high school, I guess, you know, I, I, I don't know, two or three weeks after I graduated, I, uh, moved into an apartment with a buddy of mine. And I think just having, you know, my own space made it, you know, you can do whatever you want. And, uh, but I do remember as in, in high school, staying away from, you know, I had some friends that smoked a lot of weed and, um, you know, pretty much stayed away from that. Um, but for some reason, something changed. Uh, one of my, my friends had, you know, access to, uh, he had a, a friend that was selling Percocets. And so I, I think that and, um, uh, Valiums. And so I decided, you know, let's give this a try. And, and so, um, part of the reason I didn't quite realize that I had a problem with alcohol was because I moved on to other things uh, and eventually circled back to alcohol. But, um, you know, pretty quickly after I, I found those opiates, opiates were the thing. Um, and so I, I went pretty, pretty crazy with uh, opiates and found out that I had kidney stones when I was 19 um, and had to get those removed. But I was able to use the prescription for that to then go doctor shopping on the internet and got a bunch of, you know, mm -hmm. prescriptions of hydrocodone coming every, you know, I think I had at one time like 10 different prescriptions coming through the mail, uh, in every month. Mm -hmm. And at some point it just became difficult to do that. And I met a guy that, you know, I could buy some pills off of him, uh, at some point couldn't even keep up with that. And, uh, he offered heroin and there was, you know, a 19, probably 19 or 20 by that point. Uh, the idea of heroin was like, why would I ever want to do that? But I was getting dope sick off of not having any, uh, any opiates and, um, you know, eventually became, you know, desperate enough that I decided, you know what, I'll give that a try. And so I snorted heroin for, I don't know, a couple of years. Um, and you know, that, that went on for a few years, ended up getting on methadone. Well, probably a couple of years at that point. Got on methadone for a little while, and uh, there was a time when the methadone clinic that, uh, you know, you're, you're told to, or I was told to go take drug tests randomly every month, and uh, there was one of those months that I uh, had to take a piss test, and uh, one of my um, badges of honor, although it's also a badge of shame, is every one of those things lit up, and, like, I had to tell the, the counselor, but I don't do cocaine, and I don't do meth, and, you know, well... You tested positive for every one of these things. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it was just nuts because, like, there wasn't a, 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 a thought in my mind that, you know, anywhere in there. And the entire time was completely unmanageable. Um, but somehow in my brain, I was able to just justify everything that I was doing as this is fun. And, you know, no matter what the consequences were that the girlfriend didn't want me around and, you know, eventually uh, dumped me, um, you know, somehow was able to, to, to string things along for a while, but uh, it probably took, you know, several years. I, I ended up getting sober just before I turned 26. So sort of 19 to 26 is kind of this blur of just, you know, 
getting high and, uh, you know, pretty much avoiding anyone and everything, uh, working just enough to survive and somehow keeping some of those jobs, but towards the end started getting fired from stuff. And anyway, back to the original question, um, you know, when did I start realizing that I actually had a problem? It was, you know, probably six years of, um, thinking that I could somehow clean it up. And, you know, there were periods where things got slightly better. Um, but really towards the very end, and we can get into that before too long, uh, you know, things got so dark that there was no question of, do I have a problem? Of course I have a problem. Uh, <laughs> there was probably a while there in that last year where I just had no idea how to stop that. I, I knew that I was so physically addicted to both, alcohol and you know opiates that i had no idea how to stop uh, no don't look at me my question for him well, what was his last year of addiction like and he just pretty much answered <laughs> yeah. that so <laughs> i was gonna ask it in that in that that six seven year period you know you kind of touched on a little bit but what were your relationships like what was jobs like were you job hopping were you getting yeah. fired were you holding on to relationships like what was life yeah, like? No, I, it was yeah. What was life like? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was it was a train wreck, right? Um, I uh, didn't finish college, so in that time, um, my parents' business failed when I was uh, about eighteen. So, like as I was going into college, couldn't do FAFSA because they hadn't done their taxes in years, and uh, you know didn't have the money to go do much and so they hold, held on to that resentment in, in the early days of sobriety for as long as i could that you know a, a bunch of my friends were given you know free rides to, to college and i had to kind of figure some things out but um yeah I, I think the last year well yeah last year i think i'd gotten fired from uh i did pizza delivery through my early 20s um just because it was one of those jobs that you know could do it drunk and high or you <laughs> yeah. know not super drunk and super high but I, the second i got off i was you know <laughs> off to the races drunk and high. especially towards that very end <laughs> i got fired from a, a papa john's went over to a pizza hut got fired from that not long after that <laughs> um you know ended up living back with my parents that last couple years uh, before things really got got terrible and um you know like i said I think I had a girlfriend that broke up with me at 23 or 24 and just, you know, tried to hide what I was doing when I was living with my parents. And it was just a, a miserable life of like unemployed towards that very end, uh, was living with my parents, had no prospects on, you know, how I was going to move forward in life. Didn't finish college. I had all my friends that, you know, had finished college and they were starting to get married and have kids and, uh, you know, have great careers and, was starting to wonder, you know, what is going to happen to my life. And so, um, totally miserable was, was the answer and had no idea how to change things. And I think there was a, a time in there where things got pretty bad. And it, somehow my parents found out that, you know, I was doing all these drugs and, um, they tried to help me out, but they had no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, non-addicts and non-alcoholics don't really know what to do with addicts and alcoholics right there's, there's yep. something that we know how to communicate with each other in a way that no one else can and amen I, you know yeah. so what was the the straw that broke the camel's back what what was it that made you decide to get help so uh went to one 12-step fellowship probably about 24 um and you know just a um wasn't willing to do anything there. Um, you know, I wanted to show up at, you know, eight o'clock and leave right at nine o'clock and didn't really get to know anyone well, and uh, certainly wasn't willing to work any steps. And, um, so, you know, but somehow life did actually get better. I stopped doing heroin, but I was still drinking and I was still doing, you know, other pills. Um, but some life actually did get slightly better for a minute. Uh, I got a decent or, you know, a job. I was running a, a yogurt store and, um, just, I guess, started to think that, well, maybe that wasn't that big of a deal. And, uh, you know, which is totally insane that, you know, just quitting heroin somehow made my life slightly better. 
Um, but not too long later, you know, went right back to doing heroin, lost everything again. Um, and I think, yeah, my dad, um, he was having, I think I was living with a drug dealer for a little while. Um, wasn't talking to anyone. I'd sold my phone, just was this kind of complete recluse and, um, ended up selling or, uh, talking to a, a friend that told me that my dad had had some strokes. And so I, I went back thinking that somehow I was going to help out, even though I was a total wreck uh, and um, was basically just causing problems for my mom. And uh, I think she didn't know that there were any sort of indigent treatment facilities around. And so one of her friends suggested uh, dropping me off at a homeless shelter in Dallas. Hmm. And uh, I mean, I think, that was the, the best that she knew. And, um, you know, cause she just, she knew that she couldn't help my dad and me at the same time and, uh, ended up breaking into a house not long after. So this, that, that lasted, you know, I stayed at that homeless shelter for a couple of weeks, ended up breaking into a, a house, um, and ended up going to jail for most of 2011. And, um, in that time kind of got some time to reflect, did uh, five months in county jail and then six months in jail rehab. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, I was just trying to figure out, like, how do I get out of here and how do I go back to the awful life that I was living? Uh, but somewhere in there kind of realized that I got to make some changes because the idea of in and out of prison, uh, which was, you know, the next step if, mm -hmm. if I was, you know, to violate probation, um, wasn't going to be a life. And, I don't know, I guess after hearing a ton of people in jail stories, most of them, whether they wanted to admit it or not, had something to do with drugs and alcohol. Maybe I should probably put a real effort into uh, staying sober. Um, so I got out and came to a 12 step fellowship and decided, you know what, I'm actually willing to do this stuff and just you know, also get willing to, or, you know, open to the, the ideas of, you know, spirituality and, um, you know, that I was not like a militant, I, I, I was never an atheist. Um, and I certainly, I, I guess I would have considered myself an agnostic because, you know, where's the proof in any of this? Mm -hmm. um, and so when I first looked at 12 steps, the idea of, you know, the whole God idea to me seemed pretty suspect, but I also didn't have any better ideas. And, you know, the luckily, doesn't take a whole lot to just give it a try and, you know, started doing some prayer and, and realized, Oh, I, uh, if I just give this a try, uh, you know, God started showing up pretty quickly. So no, no inpatient treatment for you. All 12 step. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was, I guess so, the, um, there's jail, jail. Six months of like jail <laughs> yeah. rehab, which is not, you know, it's not, real rehab it's mostly just keeping people locked up um and there was you know very little recovery just a uh, the counselor that i had in there uh had been sober for a while and she kind of brought a little more recovery into it but i think you know in a way i'm kind of grateful that it, it was or it wasn't too you know recovery related because it, it led me to be starved for what I'd seen in that first 12 step fellowship where like there's something that these people have. And, you know, I, I knew that I just wasn't willing to do anything there. Um, and so when I got out, there was like just this, yeah, I was, I was starved for genuine and authentic people in a way that, you know, the people in jail just, you could tell everyone was kind of trying to act like they were important for some reason, but we were all in jail for the same similar reasons. But, and we don't really have that program here. I mean, not for the jail side, just prison. Yeah. And then it's, yeah. that one don't work too well. No. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I think that's the, the sad part is like, you know, in, in Dallas, there's, um, you know, they, they consider them, um, what is it? it's, it's, you know, still basically jail, but, uh, it's, you know, I guess later on, if you do go to prison, there's safe P that's the sort of prison version. Um, but they're, you know, therapeutic community. So it's not 12 step based of any sort. I and mean, there's no, 
you know, God concept of anything. Um, can't say that it was amazing, but I, I did come out of there just knowing that I, I got to latch on to something and the way that I've been living my life was not a good one. So tell us a little bit about early sobriety then. Yeah, uh, I got a sponsor quickly. Um, part of the the probation stipulations were first week, you got to go find someone. So uh, one of the first meetings that I went to, uh, well, the first meeting I went to was a women's detox facility that I didn't even realize it was a women's detox facility. <laughs> <laughs> it happened. It was sure. the, How do you explain that one? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> It, it was it was crazy you know I'd, I'd spent 11 months in jail and i come out and i i you know was just looking up on on the internet where's this cl the closest meeting and i uh, found this place that was you know, a couple miles from uh, i went to go live, live with, back with my mom uh, when i first got out and um went to this this meeting and you know i, I just see a bunch of like really sad but because i'd been in jail for 11 months really hot uh, girls and uh, you know I immediately like try to just leave and they say you know are you looking for a meeting because if you do or if you are then this is a place for you luckily there was uh, a lady that was there that, that told me to go to you know what's my now my home group but um, she uh, she suggested that went over to this other meeting and you know the first guy that I talked to after that meeting uh, has been my sponsor for the last you know, 12 years. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, it you know, is really cool. celebrated 13 years. First year was kind of the jail year and then um, you know, 12 years of actually working a program. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he was really kind um, and he'd had some problems with sobriety early on. Uh, he ended up getting sober, you know, after bouncing in and out uh, for a long time and um, I think within, you know, the first time that we actually sat one-on-one, -on -one, I just realized this guy actually knows what he's talking about. He knows what I've been through in a way that not many other people had. And, um, so, you know, I, I, he, I, he gained my trust quickly. And when he asked me to do something, I did it. Uh, he told me to call him uh, every day at 7am and did that for the first couple of years. And just, you know, kept things really simple. Um, he wasn't trying to explain the whole program in the first hour. It was just, you know, show up and go to some meetings and we'll work some steps. And when it says to pray, we pray. When it says to write, we write. And, um, you know, I think that was the sort of magic of it was it wasn't an overwhelming, you got to figure it all out today. Don't have it all figured out today, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. years in. There's still more to learn on this thing, but um, I got busy with what he was suggesting and uh, none of it became, you know, I started to get to know people. I started, you know, being, was told to show up early and stay late and become a part of the fellowship and um, really, you know, just jumped in. How quickly into your sobriety did the promises of the fellowship come true for you? Um, I think... It took a while because, you know, it, I burned most of the bridges before I showed up and people were pretty skeptical. You know, my, my friends and family knew that I'd been in jail for a year and they were pretty leery of, you know, who I was, um, which they had every right to be. I, I, you know, there was a time when I was, you know, why, why aren't these people welcoming with me with open arms? Well, because I lied to them and cheated and <laughs> stolen from them constantly for the last several years. And, um, you know, it, it took some, some actual effort. I think really, you know, before I started doing the amends process, um, no one really started trusting anything. And, you know, some of that was that it, it needed to take some time, but I think, um, excuse me, I, um, it probably took, you know, six or eight months to get to the amends process. And, um, that was when some of those promises really started showing up that, you know, people saw that I was really trying to do things differently today. And I mean, I, I'm pretty sure my mom didn't trust that I was going to stay sober for two or three years. Um, cause she just, you know, yeah, she, she had some baggage that, and you know, I, I was not showing her or previously wasn't doing very well. And so, uh, you know, it, it took her a long time, to really trust, oh, Will's actually doing something right. Um, when I and she also tried to keep me away from starting a business, or not, you know, she 
she didn't love her her entrepreneurial journey because the business didn't go you know super well. She stayed in business for twenty something years, um, but it wasn't you know didn't provide her with a, a secure retirement or anything. And so um, when I started doing the Kickstarter thing, she kind of you know, the Kickstarter is how I started the business. Um, and, uh, she was pretty leery. Uh, he's just, you know, he's, why would he start up a business? He, he needs to just go work for somebody. And so that, that probably put a, a damper on some of the, uh, early recovery or, you know, some of the promises on, well, just, you know, she, she w- wasn't trusting much of what I was doing for a while, which was totally fine. But what's your sobriety date? Uh, January 29th, 2011. When did you start the Kickstarter? Uh, that was July of 2012. So that was one of those terrifying things in early sobriety. Gee, a year and a half in, 18 months in. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it, right? Like I'd been out, you know, I, I got out of jail in like the end of November of 2011. I uh, found out about that Kickstarter in probably February of 12. And then, you know, the next few months I was figuring out how to make prototypes and how to get, you know, a decent video made. And, um, so, you know, there was definitely some terror with, uh, starting the Kickstarter because, you know, what if people go searching and find who I am and somehow it's never been a big thing. I mean, this is like the first actual public thing that I've, I've, you know, certainly spoken at some meetings, but, um, I've never really shattered from the rooftops what, you know, who I am. Um, from a, uh, you know, junkie <laughs> background. And, you know, <laughs> these days I can talk about it willingly because I, I hope that it is a message of recovery uh, and, you know, message of hope, I guess, yes. that people can hear that and like, wait, this guy went to some pretty low lows and somehow has rebuilt his life through a power greater than myself. God has done amazing things in my life. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And short amount of time. I mean, 18 <clears throat> months is nothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. They tell you not to do anything crazy in your first year. <laughs> but yeah. Well, and th- that was the, 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 you know, my sponsor's never been particularly you know, rigid on timeframes for things that he, you know, no matter what you do, it will either bring you closer to God or further away. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that if you want to go do, you know, some, some drastic things, like I told him, I think when I was, when we sat down to do our, our, um, or my fifth step, um, he told me that, uh, or I I was telling him, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do these pins. And he never told me, you know, what kind of harebrained idea is this? Cause it was definitely a harebrained idea to start (laughs) off with. You're, you're going to go, try to raise money from people on the internet. Um, okay, good luck. <laughs> and, you know, he's, it's, it's always been uh, this kind of God's going to show you what you need to do that, you know, you'll, you'll learn how to trust your gut and um, you know, what's right and wrong. Go do some good in the world. Okay. So where's that first prototype? <clears throat> Ooh, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. It's locked in a safe. I don't think I even in the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah. It should um, be. There, might, there actually might be a box in my garage or maybe at the shop somewhere that has some of that early we'll stuff. We'll come down and we'll but help I'm, you I'm look not, for it. <laughs> I that? have seen the collection at Tactile Turn of the pins that you have in the conference room. I'm yeah. surprised it's not in there. Because that's a heck it's, of a... Uh, Again, I'm just, so I'm not much of a collector of my own stuff. Like I, I have, so cool. I don't know, 20 or 30 of my own pens, but um, I, I try to live a pretty simple life as far as not collecting too much stuff. <laughs> um, I, I certainly have a fair amount of stuff, but I, I also just, you know, I'm not an archivist that's really been documenting this whole whole journey. And like, you know, there were years where I didn't know if this was going to turn out Hell, there are t- times today that I wonder, you know, how it's going to turn out. And I've got 43 employees. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm just not that sentimental on, you know, the, the very first machine. Uh, I just wasn't going to have space uh, when I actually moved into my own shop. And so people sometimes ask me, you know, why didn't you keep that? And like, because it, it served its purpose and then it yep. it didn't. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I I... 
I could see that with the machine. I can't see that with that pen. <laughs> me, I'd still be using it. But, yeah. I know me. Uh, there's also <laughs> things have changed so much over the years that like, um, you know, those early pens, you know, I, I, I have to look back and give myself, you know, some grace that I was doing the best I could with what I knew. But I look back at some of those old pens and I, I look, you know, at what we do today it's just such a night and day difference that like it probably took three, four five years before I really became, you know, really proud of what, what I made. Mm -hmm. um, and th the crazy thing is like, you know, I, I customers always loved that stuff, even the, the early stuff. And so I can be very critical of some of that early stuff, but that's the way that like kind of any, and I, I sometimes struggle to, to say that it's an, an art, but you know, within any discipline no one starts off amazing you got to put in some hours mm -hmm. to get decent at something and so i think that's probably part of the uh the the fact that i don't have a, a ton of nostalgia for those early early pins that you know i know that i was still very much learning what i was doing for a, quite a while yeah i think what you just said can relate to recovery in a big way yeah you're, you're not great yeah. right off the bat you know it takes a lot yeah. of work and it takes Mm -hmm. patience and time and uh yeah. i love that that you, you stuck it out because now we're we are reaping the benefits I, like, well, and <laughs> we, i love how you said too it served its purpose like yeah oh yeah i, I mean yeah. like there's parts of our recovery and it's like okay that serves that purpose at that time right, right? for sure so so you talked about your uh I mean, your relationships in the midst of your um addiction or substance abuse you know um as opposed to those relationships then and your relationships now how would you um how would you describe your relationships now and who were, you know, as far as family, friends, who were some of the big people that, you know, really helped you along the way? Yeah. Um, I mean, such a night and day difference, right? I, I was, and I'm still friends with, with some of my friends, you know, from, from those early days. Uh, I still have quite a few friends from Boy Scout days in high school. Um, and, you know, some of those I'm really close with my best friend, Eric, I've known since I was like five, he's been through, you know, all of it. And, um, he's really the, probably the, the, the person that has really seen such a transformation and, you know, um, but there's also lots of people that, you know, were there through the active addiction that just never, you know, my parents passed away. So my, my dad passed away. A week after I got locked up uh, in early 2011, uh, my mom passed away in uh, 2018, um, and so you know we we were able to completely rebuild our relationship over those you know I guess so it's that seven years um, in a way that was pretty amazing. That you know um, a lady that was you know she she had to keep me at, at arm's distance towards the very end. Uh, and I think the counselor that I had in jail, uh, talked her into letting me, you know, come back to live with her because, you know, rates of, of recidivism are pretty high among people that don't have any friends or family. Um, but yeah, just, um, the relationship there was completely rebuilt in a way that was pretty amazing. Um, you know, I think her work ended up calling me the day that, uh, she passed away because I was her point of contact. And like, I don't think I ever actually got told that I was her point of contact for anything. Um, but, you know, we went to lunch every Sunday. Uh, I moved out of that, her house. I don't know, um, year, a year or so after I moved in there. Um, but we, we remained really close, um, was able to rebuild m the relationship with my, my best friend who, um, never really held any grudges. He was, he was always good about that, but, um, you know, I've got a five-year-old daughter, he's got a five-year-old daughter and uh, I think a nine-year-old son. And so, you know, we're, we're, we hang out a fair amount these days. Um, um, but yeah, you know, none of the relationships towards the very end, like I, I was very much a recluse towards the end and shoved people away as much as I could. And these days I really do try to build community wherever I go. Um, and have a, a tremendous group of friends. Um, did get divorced about three years ago, but I was married for a while. Um, and you know, my ex-wife and I are on great terms. Um, you know, 
we have a, a five-year-old daughter that um, is, you know, light of both of our lives. And, uh, you know, I guess when I did get divorced, there was like, and I knew that we were going to have to have, you know, be on pretty decent terms, but uh, it's, it's just amazing that, you know, through divorce, we can still be good friends and be there for our daughter. Um, you know, all the people that I work with, most of them are, you know, it's always difficult to be buddies with mm -hmm. employees, but generally most of my employees, um, especially the guys that I'm, I'm closest with at the shop are good friends. Um, let's see. You got a great yeah. group of guys that work for you, gals too. Oh, yeah. I gotta like, say, I gotta take my hats off to him because he just shared with us that his father passed while he was locked up, and he didn't go back to drinking when he got out. Hats off to you, buddy, because I'd say that would have been something that would have triggered me off the top. Mm -hmm. You know, so the fact that you was able to come out and still continue your recovery, even though having that on you, that's some powerful stuff, man. Congratulations. Thank you. And you know, that's that's. When things get so bankrupt that you know you got to make some changes that's that's ab or where i was at where you know i think i i know that, that god works in my life and in, in strange ways um but you know the fact that i got connected with with the sponsor that i currently have or that i've had since the beginning um and you know god certainly nudges people together and you know certain we're very likely you know, the fact that we're talking today is God nudging me and Shane together, uh, you know, at, at a knife show, whatever, a couple of years ago, um, you know, there's all those like strange instances where I, God pushes me towards people and, and uh, I, I can consider it, you know, chance, but the reality is I, I get, or I guess when I start asking for, you know, I need some help on something, someone shows up uh, and same thing. If I can be helpful to someone else, it's hard to think that that's just chance that, you know, I was trying to find my very first order with tactile term, but I couldn't find, it. I must've deleted those old emails. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was like, look I, it up, but... I was, I was trying to figure out what year that was. And I don't even so know how I found tactile term. We did change, uh, you know, originally it was Kickstarter for a while. And then I had a website through Squarespace and, I think 2016 or 17, we moved over to Shopify. Um, so if you if it was before then, then it's hard to know. But <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. I do know that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, uh, Will. Thanks for. I mean, thanks for for sharing. And and you said earlier about you know you've never done it on a scale like this. Um, and then I'm sitting here thinking. You know, I met Shane. Shane got me obsessed with pens. This idea of a <laughs> podcast was born. And then it's like, hey, we, you know, this is, we really want to be a sponsor, you yeah. know? And then it's just like, and then your story. And then it's like, wow, we're, we're connected in so many ways. And I've never met you, you know, until right, right now. Yeah. And it's just kind of awesome what recovery <clears throat> can actually do, you know? And that is God. Talk about nudging people together. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> yeah. what I was thinking. It's, it's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, because we all write. That's all we do. Yeah, none yeah. of us type in this room. Well, I, tried I mean, once, but I got scalded for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Do you sponsor anybody? You yeah. have any sponsees? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've I've sponsored a ton of guys over <laughs> the years, but uh, you know, currently, uh, I guess I've got three that are active. Um, but, you know, there are also several that have moved away. I've got uh, one down in Austin that, you know, I, I when I sponsor guys, I try to make sure that I actually see them pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, he's down in Austin. Or a couple guys are down in Austin. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I absolutely, you know, can't keep it unless you give it away, right? And um, I also, I mean, it, it's, it's the thing that recharges my batteries more than anything else that, you know, talking with someone that, is going through some stuff reminds me, you know, how far I've come. And also it's just nice to be able to feel useful, you know, business and, and personal life can be one thing, but there's just this like different thing that happens in recovery that, um, you know, I'm so grateful. The only way that I, or I can never repay my sponsor for what he's done for me, but the only thing I can do that that's kind of a, 
you know, a, a bit of repayment is trying to do the same thing with others. And, uh, you know, my, my sponsor jokes that, you know, he issues a spiritual lasso after we finish that 12 step. And, um, he's been, well, I, I guess I got my first sponsor, like literally the next day after I was issued that spiritual lasso. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I think, I don't know about you guys, but, um, you know, sometimes people, or I see guys that, uh, wait for someone to ask them to sponsor. And, you know, anytime I see a new guy at a meeting or someone that I don't recognize, and sometimes those people have 20 years, sometimes those guys are brand new and, uh, you know, it's, it's what an honor to be able to try to, you know, share what we have with someone else. Um, and I'll, I, I, I'm always amazed at how, how great it is to be able to pass this thing on to someone else. Um, yeah, I will never be able to, to think enough for what, what's what been given to me. I just find it amazing you had the same sponsor. Yeah. It's genuinely strange because, you know, I, I, everyone has their own journeys. I, you know, he moved uh, to Fort Worth, so, you know, an hour away years ago and i was really debating is that you know do we get to see each other enough and uh so i was debating on finding someone else but you know moving back to dallas not too long after that and he's just always been this you know this great guy that's that's mm. um but yeah no certainly i i and i, I guess it, it was always told to me you know it, if you and i try to tell my guys the same thing you know i, I don't want you to ever feel like you're a obligated to work with me right like if if you feel like you're at a different point in your life that i can't help you then please go find someone else right and and the fact that i'm just not going to shove this down anyone's throat some people need a sponsor that's really gonna gonna give them probably more stern direction than i'm willing to give but anytime anyone asks me anything uh, i'm glad to help out And, and it's just amazing how how wildly different everyone's you know sponsorship style is um i love some of those crusty old guys in those early meetings that <laughs> were, you know, were, were quick to tell people to sit down and shut up. And, uh, I don't really do that these days, but, um, I'm, I'm glad that I heard some of that. And I think there's, there's a, a spot for all of us. Right. Yeah. I don't know what I would have done if I wouldn't have had somebody in a meeting that said it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that's what it took for me is hearing angry Scott hearing if you want to quit getting a white key tag, here's what you need to do. Yeah. That's what it took. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So how do yeah. you maintain and, your, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask. So, um, you know, with your sponsorship and everything like that, what does your program look like now? How do you maintain your sobriety? Yeah. So same thing that, that was told to me early, uh, early days, um, three meetings a week minimum. Um, I guess, you know, those early days when we were going through the steps, uh, we would sit down once a week and go through that. Uh, and I try to make sure that I've always got, you know, someone to meet with generally once a week, uh, to make sure that we're working through some steps with, with, you know, or I'm walking them through some steps, um, you know, prayer and meditation, um, I guess is, you know, a, a, a big piece of my life these days. Um, so, you know, get on my knees in the morning and get on my knees at night and certainly say some prayers throughout the day. Um, spend some time getting quiet and uh, listening and um, trying to just stay involved. I mean, I, I, we do uh, dinner with a, a group of, we got a text chain with sort of my sponsor and uh, my sort of sponsee brothers and my sponsees and those other guys sponsees. We have a, a lineage meeting once a year where we get, you know, there's all of our sponsors and sponsees, it's, you know, a couple hundred people that get together, uh, every, I guess the first December. Um, anyway, we, we are, our sort of more local group. We've got about 20 guys that are on a text chain and, uh, we do dinner before a Thursday night meeting, try to go grab uh, breakfast with the guys after I go to a Saturday uh, men's meeting. Um, you know, try to just be active in the fellowship. Um, you know, I, I, 
was skeptical about the whole getting really involved. And I, I also, I think because I showed up at 26, basically, um, most of the guys that were in the meeting that I went to were significantly older and, um, I don't know. I did. It, I didn't quite believe that these guys were going to become some of our best friends. <laughs> Lately, we've gotten you know a fair amount more younger guys, and we've got a good mix of you know twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies. And so you know, really just try to stay active in the fellowship and make sure that you know they're for people. And uh, I guess when I was going through the divorce, um, when my mother died, you know, there, there's all sorts of places that people showed up for me in, in incredible ways and try to make sure that I'm there for people in the same way. And, you know, when there's a, a brand new guy that I haven't seen in a couple of weeks that I got his number, I, you know, I don't chase anyone down, but I certainly do try to make sure that people understand where are you? Um, Cause people can just fade into the woodwork. I, if I was allowed to fade into the woodwork, I, I certainly wouldn't be here today, mm-hmm. but because people kind of showed an interest in, hey, where are you? I that's what's cool about it. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty neat about recovery. They'll show up at your door. Yeah, they yeah. will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's a good thing, right? Like a it's, 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 I mean, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a lonely thing. And, and you know, sometimes when when you get down, it's pretty easy to to think, you know what? It's going to just be better if I just stay home tonight. No, it's not. Go out there and go do something. Yeah. And it's hard to do sometimes. Mm-hmm. So you've had a lot of blessings since you've been in recovery. I mean, a lot of yep. a lot of good things happened. But what is your biggest surprise that recovery has given you? Ooh, um, I think just how, how amazing and how nice it is to be transparent with people. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think that was one of the early Kickstarter lessons. I, I ran out of money. Um so I made all these, like the, the first Kickstarter, I sold uh, about a thousand pins to 611 people. And I'd made that thousand pins, but uh, I'd ran out of the money to do the shipping. And so I made this terrible website and I basically did an update on Kickstarter telling people. Uh, so we, and you know, those pins were supposed to be delivered in I think four or five months and they took the better part of a year to do. Luckily, those early days on Kickstarter, people were, um, the, you know, I got to do updates and I got to show people the progress that was happening. And, uh, you know, when it came time to tell people, hey, I've run out of money, uh, I'm going to go find a regular job. Um, and, but if you want, you can go ahead and buy another pen. I made, you know, a few extras. Um, but I was really expecting the pitchforks to come out. And, and, and I think this has happened in a few <laughs> other ways along, along the journey. Um, but luckily people pretty well understood. All right, you've put in some hard work. This is taking, this has been a, a much harder project than you expected it to be. Uh, and there, I think we're, you know, two or three angry people, the other 611 of them were just, you know, congrats, you've, you've made it this far and, you know, sold another three or $4,000 of the pens that paid for the shipping for all of that stuff within a couple of days. But the transparency that, that, I was able to, to, you know, tell people about what was going on. I'm sure I went to my sponsor at the time and told him, I don't know how this is going to go. And I'm sure his, I, I, I don't remember the exact words, but I, I know he told me basically tell people what's going on and you'll be surprised. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, because before sobriety, I was lying, cheating and stealing from everybody. You know, I knew that that path didn't work very well. And, uh, throughout the years, if I can just tell people what's going on, um, and the fact that I haven't had to lie, cheat and steal from people, I can just be a decent person these days. And there are certainly going to be problems. Um, you know, when, when the Kickstarter project was running long, I was expecting that there was going to be more pitchforks and, you know, especially in those early days of the business, I expected pitchforks to show up, you know, one way or another. And somehow, <laughs> People were kind and, um, you know, if, if I was being honest and upfront and transparent about what was going on, then people showed up uh, and were, were happy to support what I was doing. And that's kind of been the whole way along, along the way, right? Like the very first loan that I got for a brand new piece of equipment in 2015, 
there was a little shame on, you know, I don't have as much in the bank account as I would like to have. And there were, there were, you know, I haven't been in business all that long. Um, and when they started asking for financial documents, I was actually pleasantly surprised. Oh, wow. You've grown this business pretty significantly in these, you know, three years that you've been in business. Um, and I think there was a banker that came out that sort of was a nice mentor kind of telling me how, how most machine shop guys, uh, build a decent life for themselves through real estate. And, um, you know, just got, I've, I've been guided along when my natural reaction is not to tell anyone about anything. <laughs> the best course of action is the exact opposite of that. Tell people about what's going on and be honest and transparent about it. And, Oh, people are very kind. <laughs> <laughs> they can be yeah. when we get honest. Yeah. We can ask some D. Yeah, man. I was going to ask, so what, what kind of message of hope or like uh, inspiration do you have for our listeners out there about recovery and that? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the biggest one is, um, yeah, I, I appreciate the comment um, earlier about how, you know, this week's been, or the last 72 hours have been hard, right? Like, uh, it is not always roses. There are plenty of times in recovery that life sucks, um, but there's always that light at the end of the tunnel that light, life does get better as long as I'm not actively making it worse. If I'm trying to push through the the difficult spots, it happens. Sometimes it takes, you know, weeks or months or years to get through those difficult times. Sometimes it happens pretty quickly. Um, but I think we all know, I certainly know how to make things worse. <laughs> putting a drink, putting a drug on it certainly doesn't, doesn't, isn't going to give me any, any better thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, life is, is not all roses, but man, sobriety, certainly is the only path that I know that that's going to make things better. And, uh, you know, staying away from the things that I ac absolutely know can crater my life pretty quickly. It's, you know, always been the thing, but also, um, yeah, I mean, figuring out that I was powerless over alcohol and drugs and everything else was a, a pretty liberating thing. Um, and there was a, a freedom that came with that. Um, but then there was also the next part of get busy and do some work and repair things, trust God, clean house and help others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th those simple words with some action change lives pretty quickly. Yes, they do. I like that with action. With mm -hmm. action. That's right. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So, Will. There's no better commercial person, I guess, than you for your own product. What all do you have available for people? I mean, pens, pencils, what? Tell us a little bit well, about tactile tool. Yeah. I didn't bring a whole lot of uh, stuff with me. I mean, you know, our, our titanium bolt action pens are kind of the staple. Uh, this is a weird uh, PVD coating that we're, we haven't released. I don't know if we will release it, uh, but our bolt action pens are kind of our, our thing. Um, and then we do several knives. This is a, a weird prototype of a, mm. uh, a different texture that we were working with Chanola on for uh, oh. the, the knives. But nice. Nice and dirty. <laughs> I, I heard it sounds stuff. good. I can't see it, but I heard it. <laughs> I mean, that, that's also part of, you know, I think we all, uh, yeah, uh, we're all, uh, you know, these things are are fun and useful and, you know, it's nice to use a well-made thing, uh, but there's also a, a, you know, fidget factor that goes along with all of it. That's just satisfying. Yep. That, uh -huh. you know, the sound <laughs> to go with it, the feel, the tactile nature. I don't Sometimes know if you could hear the fidget it. factor is probably more useful than anything else. Um, I'm not much of a, you know, they're the guys that do spinners and other fidget toys uh, for, you know, their everyday carry. I'm not much of one of those guys, but I do want, there would be a fidget factor with my pen and my knife. Oh, uh, we're, I think 
this weekend we're going to be launching some flashlights at Blade West or Blade Texas. Nice. Uh, so we're we're about to start doing some flashlights. Um, but you know, bolt action nice. pens are kind of our staple. We also do this style called the side click uh, for pens. We got a few different knife models. Um, you know, I, I'm I love what we do because it's it's you know it's the same kind of thing that I've tried to do with recovery where it's it's genuine and it's honest just clean nice. simple well-made stuff um good materials we have a lifetime warranty with everything we do um use great quality materials from the very beginning um and you know when it comes down to it these are fairly simple items that are just made well and that's that's why i love my company and it's why i love the, the guys that i work with because we're all dedicated to the same thing of making good stuff that we can stand behind um, that, you know, we offer a lifetime warranty because we make good stuff and uh, you know, don't. Yeah. And it don't really break. Mm -hmm. You know, Will, if you need anybody to uh, try out those prototypes, you know what I mean? Just to see if you want to go to market yeah. with those, I can, I can give you my address after this. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> this, <laughs> this uh, to, we're always uh, looking for some extra data testers. I can do it. I can be a tester. Yeah. Yeah. I'm waiting Alpha for, test or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for you to come out with notebooks. You know, so we, we've debated on that and, and, you know, we have gotten more into, um, you know, for a long time, I didn't really want to sell anything that I, I didn't make. Mm -hmm. Um, but then, you know, Greg Stevens, this guy that does leather work has made some leather slips for us mm -hmm. and, uh, some notebook covers. Um, you know, we've, the guy that does our packaging, you know, we, we found a, a guy that's uh, local in Dallas that does packaging and uh, he can do, you know, bound books. And so we've considered doing, you know, smaller notebooks for, for note taking. I, there are times that I, I use a notebook a fair amount and then there are times that I don't. And, you know, I think one of the, the that conversation, I think it was last year, or the year before Shane, where we were talking about journaling and, you know, the, the pen to paper thing is just entirely different from, um you know typing that there's something spiritual that happens when i put pen to paper that doesn't happen with typing and you know it, it was probably first illustrated when i started writing my first fourth step um the magic that is pens and paper that somehow different stuff comes out that way than when i when i type it out and um i think that's that's one of those like reasons that i fell in love with pins to start off with and what what started you know all the other products that we make but yeah i, I haven't really wanted to, to sell too much of things that we didn't make but i'm also starting to realize that as long as we partner with the right people that also have the same values of you know good quality stuff that yes. they stand behind um you know we probably can do more stuff and so notebooks probably aren't too far away good Nice. A5, please. A5. <laughs> um, yeah, boy. I, I like the size of the A5s, but I remember when I left, um, when did those notebooks from Greg Steven come out? Um, was that last think, year or the uh, year before? I think it was two years ago, but I don't really remember. Because when but I yeah. was in Dallas, they hadn't come out yet, and Kevin sent me home with one. So I'm on the plane okay. taking pictures, and he told me, go ahead, post pictures. So I'm on a plane taking pictures. I'm all over the place just taking pictures of mm -hmm. it because I finally got something early. <laughs> I was happy. I was showing, showing that off. Showing off, right? Yeah. I got you know. <laughs> but that's what we wanted to do is promote it. Yeah. So, yeah, having that. Okay. I got way too much Greg Stevens leather around here. I mean, he's he's the nicest guy in the world. And I, and I think that's the thing that I really like about the sort of knife EDC world is um, – and not everyone's a savory character, but there are generally a lot of really good guys that, that, you know, that they don't like, and I don't have a giant business, but one of the big principles that we have is make sure that we pay people well. And, you know, we take care of people with, you know, decent health insurance and, you know, try to try to have a, a, a good safe shop for people to work in. And, um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to work with other people that, that do the same thing. And sometimes those guys are doing it in their garage. Sometimes they have, you know, a way bigger company than us. Um, but, you know, the thing that I like about the whole everyday carry movement thing that's going on is a lot of it is just 
genuinely, you know, good people making good quality products. Cause I think we've all just bought too much crap in our lives that doesn't hold up very well. And it's nice to have stuff that you really can count on. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And I can tell you, everybody at your shop has a big heart and that always starts at the top. Right. I mean, we talked about it here, leadership. You're only as, as good as your weakest link. Yep. Yeah. And um, I will, I, I don't talk about it enough, but you know what Boy Scouts did for me with leadership training. Um, yeah. I mean, if you set a decent example, then the people that, that are around you know who and what you are. Yep. Well, I don't know. We thank you a ton for sponsoring the show. Yes. I mean, it's a tool that we all use all the way down to the knives. Mm -hmm. I think this is my favorite fixed blade and I've had some really good fixed blades. Mm -hmm. I like this little thing fits well, but I'll never give up a tactile turn pen. No. Funny story. So I, I, I have two that I use regularly and I leave one at work because I just want to have, make sure I have one everywhere. Well, I took it home the other day cause I was working at Kirkwood and I left it on my nightstand and I had to use a different pen all day yesterday. Oh, man. it was the worst experience, <laughs> brother. I would, I would lend you one. I know. And I, you know, oh, and it's gosh. funny, but it's, it's once you get one and I'm, and I'm telling everybody, like, once you get one, you'll never want to use anything else. And that is absolute fact. And we, and you guys know my wife and, and, and she thought we were crazy for buying mm -hmm. this pen. So did I. My first pen. <laughs> she thought, yeah, you said I was, was going to yeah. bust you out on it yeah. too. And now she's got three, uh -huh. you know? So it's like, okay. I have two and and she doesn't like to write with anything else either. And it's right. like, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. one, of, one of the gentlemen at this uh, square uh, circle that we got going on here almost refused to use one of these pens because he just didn't it didn't matter to him <laughs> and he finally put one in his yeah. hand and now you heard him it's all oh. he can use <laughs> uh -huh. not only that will but i have one sitting in the armrest of my car waiting for him um it's the golf one the golf seasonal and um it will he, be mine he loves the golf <laughs> oh yes it will and, be mine. <laughs> and he actually turned it down before he ever wrote with one and now it just it's waiting for him i won't sell it to anybody else i do have a question how do you come up with your seasonals if you can tell us yeah good question so and i think this is the the really great part of growing the company my taste is you know generally boring <laughs> like plain titanium or you know uh, you know simple simple colors i'm i'm red green colorblind uh and so you know, I, I see colors a little differently than everyone else. Um, so I'm not the guy that chooses the seasonals. Um, the guy that, that does our social media, Ed Jelly, uh, is sort of the, the main guy. Um, but we have a, a few other people that give some, some input. If it was up to me, we would sell boring titanium pens and nothing else. Um, but man, you know, that, that's one of the gifts of, because, you know, I, I, I don't need to be the only, like, I, I think it was years ago, you know, I, I gave up the idea that I needed to control or that I needed to have all ideas come through me that if you got a good idea, let's do it. Let's give it a try. And, you know, the, the first seasonal um, safety first was like a, a, a good hit. And it took us a while to really figure out how to do, you know, thousands of Cerakoted pins, but um, we now have a pretty good, good team and we've got two good painters and a prep guy. And, you know, we're, we're able to crank out enough stuff where we do a, a pretty good job with a uh, really good job with what we do. And, and it's, it's pretty neat to know that like, I can trust all the guys in my shop that, you know, everyone's good at a lot of different things. And if I'm, I'm here to, to steer the ship, certainly, <laughs> but I'm not the guy that makes all the decisions on everything. Uh, you know, I, I had a business partner, my first business partner, my only, but well, currently I've got a few guys that are also equity partners in the, I've got, I guess, five smaller equity partners in the knife company. And then basically two guys that are equity partners on the pin side of things. Uh, I still have majority on, on both businesses, but um what a weight off my shoulders that you know the first partner came on and he basically offered his services for marketing and sales um which i'm still a big part of the sales side of things and marketing as well but um he took some weight off my shoulders and i i quickly learned that 
it's it's time to start trusting other people can do stuff. Um, not that I was ever, you know, too much of a, a control freak, but it's been really nice to be able to, to <laughs> you know, find good people and empower those people to do things that I would never be able to do on my own. And so right. those seasonals are not my thing, but I think they're all super cool. They are. I, I, I'm always right. amazed what Ed comes up with. We own every single one of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Not yet. I need to get my hands uh, on one of those safety first, so man, but they just. Whew. Yeah, I have one out there. The only one we don't have is the new ice fall yet. No, I got oh. my. Uh, yeah, I did get Conley that for his birthday. My my son just turned fourteen, and now he's obsessed with these oh. pens too. And he three D printed a box for it. So that's awesome. <laughs> that is really cool. <laughs> I'll have to bring that in and show that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. I mean, I I think. Uh, one of my, my buddies, he's got a kid that's uh, 16 and I've been trying to get him to, to bring the kid to the shop because the kid sounds very much like I was where I was a pretty lazy kid, um, smart, but lazy and something about manufacturing and just, you know, keeping your hands busy has been really good for me. And, um, there's something really, you know, I guess satisfying about making some some cool stuff and mm-hmm. uh so i i whenever i hear stories of uh, a kid that's you know got a 3d printer ooh, that's that kid's going places i don't know where the, <laughs> what those places are but i'm excited to, to hear you know what happens to that kid in five years what happens right. in 10 years we all have strange journeys but it's pretty neat to when when some someone's got an interest in manufacturing in any way and 3d printers are bringing a whole new generation of yes, people to, to manufacturing i think it's it's pretty cool yeah awesome absolutely anybody got anything else no i just wanted to uh will honestly really appreciate you coming on the show and and sharing your story and um it was it's a pleasure to to hear your story and this always kind of um i know that these guys think a lot of of the same thing it's it it, it pumps you up you know it kind of gets your get your blood going and uh seriously thank you so much uh for for coming on and, and being our sponsor of and providing people with Great the best pens. writing utensil <laughs> there is. And, and, yeah. and we don't say that just because we use them. We say that because it's true. Um, but, but thank you again. We, we really appreciate you, uh, you being here. Yeah. I, I appreciate you guys having me. And I mean, it's been an honor. So thank you. Yeah. I can't wait um, until everybody finds out you're really in recovery. You work a program. What's that do? I, I hope it really launches it. And um see a lot of orders from it because there's nothing better right yeah thanks again well man it was a real honor to have you on the show brother i appreciate you sponsoring us and uh tell me when we started this podcast i didn't see this coming but you know i'm glad that like you said we got nudged together here it was a great pleasure to meet you brother so someone mentioned kirkwood earlier who what, what was the, the the kirkwood reference so i we have uh so we we all work in substance uh tr- abuse treatment and we have an yeah. outpatient uh, facility in Kirkwood, Missouri. Yeah. So my, uh, my grandparents lived in Kirkwood. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. My mom's side of the family. And so we would go there, you know, it's, so that, that's the, one of the, <laughs> All right. is it a suburb oh, of St. Louis or is it me. just a neighborhood in? Uh, it's, uh, it's downtown Kirkwood. Okay. Right past the yeah, train so station. Right past the train station. Yeah. I, I drove by their house, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. My ex-wife's family, uh, lives in um gerald now so it's like an hour away yeah. um they used to live in owensville and so like mm-hmm. you know, I, I love missouri it's such a beautiful place uh, that's, <laughs> he doesn't live here that's why he can say that <laughs> let's just say we can't wait to come down there yeah, and, right. and okay. do a spot because what, we could all the, use a break from know, this <clears throat> no one no one loves or no one appreciates what they've got it's it's always you know Grass is always so greener. greener. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. There are times that I, I look at Dallas and like, what? Why do I live here? But there's also a ton of great things that happen. You know, right? I love maybe Dallas maybe cigars. Uh, yeah. I, I guess an hour east or an hour west of uh, west of St. Louis is really pretty country. Oh yeah. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. Well, that's where their other location is. Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of funny. They're, About a they're hour and a half northwest yeah. of of uh st louis so yeah, they're northwest so um yeah hopefully one day we'll be able to get down to yep. visit tactile turn eat some trinkies mm-hmm. 
Best food ever. And possibly do a podcast right there in Tactile Turn Shop. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Will, thank you. I know I'm just going to, and it's going to reiterate what the guys said. I just do, really do appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. You know, the two things um, I think we could take away from this is no matter where you are in the United States, the world, the program is the same. You know, you hit on that. The the sayings were the same, you know, sit down, shut up and listen, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when, when we had talked, when you talked about the, the best thing that's happened in recovery, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily tactile turn or or family it was it was your character your morals and that was honesty you know and being transparent with others and i think that's a a great uh, message to send out to our listeners for sure so um i always end with a bible verse i know shane you're going to say something but first peter 4 10 came to mind each of you each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of god's grace in its various forms Amen. Yeah, you're good at that. Yeah, you are. That's your gift. That's my gift. <laughs> yeah. I memorize it. You look up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't thank you enough, man. And I can't wait to see you again. Um, just thanks for everything. Thanks for sharing your story because there's going to be someone out there that needed to hear it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, always bring, always bring that message of hope. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's about. So, hey, God bless you, Will. We will see you soon. I promise you, you that. We will see you soon. Don't go anywhere. Let's just say goodbye to the listeners. Yeah, there, for man. all the listeners out there, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We are on all podcast platforms. Uh, will, thank you again from Tactile Turn, our amazing sponsor. We will see you guys next week. Peace. Peace.